A lot has been made of the Titan arc of the Aroma Reborn storyline. People argue of how slow it is and such, how it's boring, and how it doesn't make sense. This last bit is the one that confuses me. The complaint that this quest chain doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense. So I want to go through all of the quest line together and put into perspective how the actions of the Company of Heroes don't just make sense, but are 100% justified. Starting off is our meeting with the Scions and our briefing of the situation. Kobolds have summoned their primal, Titan. The only known group to have defeated Titan no longer exists. These are the Company of Heroes. They were a large group of mercenaries, normal people in Eorzea seeking to protect while earning the coin to live their lives. Given they were just mercenaries, they didn't exactly have intentions of writing dissertations on how they defeated primals. As such, when they disbanded around the time of the Calamity, there was no knowledge of how they managed without asking them directly. Let's put a pit in this for later. The threat level of what we will have to face is also put into perspective here. The Echo will avail us not. Even the game is outright saying that our triumph over Ifrit was a fluke. It's only because of the Echo that we won. Titan, we will need to prepare ourselves physically with proper gear to succeed. Match rock with steel. Or as Justola puts it, if you are to survive, your steel must needs speak for you. No one would think you a coward were you to decline. Let's put a pin in this too. Papalina, and to top it off, not only do we not have the knowledge of the Company of Heroes, we don't really have any info at all. All we really know is Titan is extremely powerful and dangerous. Even the greatest minds within the Scions can't help you on that aspect. You'll have to journey out into the world and try and find the company on your own. But first, let's head over to the Maelstrom for another briefing. The Admiral herself addresses us here, seeking our aid. But Ustola is quick to retort with a bit of hard truth. The Kobolds do not attack unprovoked. The Kobolds are a defensive tribe, and there was a non-aggression treaty in place with Limsa Lominsa, Kobolds and the Sahagin. But Limsa is the one that broke this treaty. The Admiral, and by extension all of Limsa, is at fault. Let's put a pin in this. But anyway, while the threat of Titan even existing is clear, there is some amount of time before all hell breaks loose. The big problem at the moment is Aether fluctuations, which will cause harm to the environment and eventually the people. But we just got done mentioning that kobolds are more defensive. They are angry enough to summon Titan, but they won't be immediately attacking, or they would have done so already. So to start, Yoshoda suggests a bit of recon. One of the Company of Heroes members would make for a great source of info, and it just so happens one has been heard to be living nearby. When we meet Tractome, or however you pronounce it, Ustola is there with a very specific comment. She finds it strange that a former member of the group of Godslayers would live in the middle of nowhere and live a menial life. Though it quickly becomes clear this man is a fraud, having defeated Titus. <laughs> Let's put another pin in this little side comment. After doing a few chores with this jerk, we have a solo duty of a contest between us. Coincidentally, it's a contest of who can break a rock first. On our quest to defeat a giant rock. Now, I'm going to make a couple of observations and counter one of the arguments in this section. First off, our friend here used an attack called Rive, an aiming frontal line attack with a short wind-up. Does this remind you of anything? Anything at all? Perhaps, I don't know, the single most infamous attack in the entire game, aside from maybe Soar? No? Over the years, something has been lost in the context of these quests. 
if you've not heard of the concept of power creep, let me quickly define it. As a game progresses in age and developers continue to add more stuff into a game, the base power level of things added tends to go up. This can include stuff that existed in the game from the start being gently buffed over time to keep up with any level of power creep. That is to say, the power creep is new stuff being added is stronger and everything else can't keep up. As such, everything must be buffed just to keep up. Final Fantasy XIV is currently seven years old. So no matter how slow the power creep came up, over seven years it would eventually surface. And so what was once quests that took much longer to complete now are over in no time, no matter what job you picked. It can sometimes be even worse due to entire reworks of jobs. Jobs like Bard do not entirely function the same as back in A Realm Reborn or Heavensward. The changes can be enough to make huge waves on lower level content that these changes were not balanced around. After talking to a few players who were around during A Realm Reborn 2, this idea seems to hold for most of the quest line. These quests took much longer, or much harder even if they were still basic mobs. This time around, I could have completely ignored the bomb and still beaten the instance. Back in the day, this never would have flown. You'd have failed no matter what class you were. A level of ludonarrative dissonance has been built because of the power creep. This entire subsection of quests were training for the character and the player, preparing you for what Titan would throw at you. And it truly began with Tractome using Landslide. But side tangent over with, it's revealed he's a fraud. <laughs> and the real Company of Heroes member is over in Costa del Sol. Everyone there apparently treats the captain like royalty. Would we then meet Weisskate? I, I, I don't know, it's rogue in names, they're hard. He's just as grizzled as was claimed and makes further comments on that being treated like royalty aspect. You fancy yourselves heroes then? Just like in the tales? So let's take a look at that pin of Yastola's comment. She found it strange that a member of the Company of Heroes would sit off in the sidelines. While Costa del Sol is a lot more public, a bardy guard for a privately owned beach is hardly out in the limelight. He even seems to outright disdain the fame of the company. Or at least, the mythologizing of them. And let's look at all of the Company of Heroes members we meet. The first is Landonel, who is now a member of the Wood Wailers. The next we meet is now Nun of the Yu Tribe, but as we learn, his goal was to become Nun before he even joined the company, and this is just a natural part of Makote life. He also says joining the Company of Heroes made him a better person, not just stronger. Brayflox lives in her Longstop, basically in her own little beast tribe. She's so far from the limelight, she's more hidden than the fraud was. And Lamani, over in Wineport, used his money to pursue his hobby out of pure passion. Every member of the company of heroes we meet was not in it for the fame or the fortune though they admit the fortune was extremely beneficial. Outsiders, including the players, only see the fame and fortune and base their personalities on that. But that couldn't be further from the truth. These were brothers and sisters in arms, fighting to protect the realm. Every benefit they had came at the cost of dozens of lives. Their party life was a band-aid to cover their scars, but as Lomani shows, some scars run very deep, and people like Tractome seek to benefit from these scars. He was a fraud, but Eustola's comment was accurate. They didn't want fame, 
They only sought to live their lives. So now here comes this hero who claims to have bested Ifrit, and their Mikote companion claims it is thanks to the power that protects from tempering. How much of this is true? Is any of it true? Can these two put any fight against Titan after I watched dozens of my friends, my family, die underfoot and under wave as we fought back the primals? No. I will not send these two to their deaths, as they may seek only fortune and fame. You're just some random adventurer to him. Why should you be trusted at all? This sets the baseline of how the entire company felt about what they were doing, and also why they would go so far to prevent you from just going and fighting Titan. Another set of comments he makes is that not being able to be tempered will not be enough. These men and women who know full well the danger fought and slew Titan without the power of the Echo. They know how truly dangerous an enemy Titan is. Many died in service of destroying the Primal. He doesn't even believe we have the power of the Echo, and people make a big stink against this whole thing. But let's take another look at of another of our pins. Even the Scions themselves told you this. The Scions of the Seventh Dawn, a small band of extremely elite mercenaries, arguably more so than probably dozens of company of hero members combined, outright told you that your echo means nothing in this context. Your defeat of Ifrit was outright said to be nothing by your own allies, your own closest trusted friends through the whole game celebrate your achievement, but aren't inflating your ego by outright admitting to you Titan is an extremely different level of challenge. He cannot be compared. People argue that this section makes no sense because you have beaten Ifrit that these trials are all pointless as we've already proven ourselves, and yet they are so quick to forget our own allies say otherwise. If our own friends say we're about to do something much more difficult, why should this man, a man who has personally seen to the demise of both Titan and Leviathan, care about what you have done with Ifrit? He outright even says he has no reason to believe we're not just some common adventurers on our way to death's door. The first quest description even says that he is verifying that we are not a fraud, as mentioned earlier. This is both in your intentions and your power. There is absolutely no way of telling what kind of fight we will have to do next except if a member of the Company of Heroes tells us. And if the only person you know that has succeeded is so sure you can't be trusted, why are we, the player base, so sure that effort was enough to prepare us? We don't. Because what we do know, nobody else does. That we are the Warrior of Light. All the Scions know so far is that we have the Echo, but the player has already seen the Blessing of Light themselves every time they get a crystal. We might not have personally figured it out yet that this is the Blessing of Light, since it's a blind playthrough in most cases, but hindsight is 2020. This Blessing is the only thing we have over the Company of Heroes that is feasibly powering us. But again, at this point, we are the only one to know about this blessing. Nobody else does. So, you are nobody, and you are too weak. At least to this guy, who has never seen you before. He also just had to deal with someone being a fraud, staining the names of those who died in their fights against Titan and Leviathan. The only course of action is to test you, and he outright says, if you can't deal with these trials, 
how can you outlast Titan? He outright is more knowledgeable than you, and you have no right to argue. And so we have to journey to gather up the pieces of the banquet. And this may be the biggest part of why people hate this section. Our goal is... a, a banquet. Just put a pin in that. And so we go off and meet Landonel, who seems to not just be avoiding the limelight, but outright hiding from his past. He had a grand taste for the life he led, because for all the danger, it was met with extreme reward. Yet when the company of heroes disbanded, he did not go on to be a mercenary on his own. He became a quote-unquote model citizen, and successfully integrated into Gridanian society. He has a stable yet dangerous job, and seeks only to continue living his life at this point. He's not seeking fame. He then goes on to tell you that you are going to go off to your death if you attempt to get the egg needed for the banquet. Naturally, we have to ignore these warnings and go kill a turtle. He applauds your efforts and sends you to Uod Noon, who is much less applauding. He sees nothing in you. Force and courage will not avail you against Titan, much like it did not avail the previous noon against Uod. And so you must learn tactics to win. Tactics like dodging landslide. And being sent back with another success, you are now sent to Brayflox to kill a goddamned dragon. People tend to complain that not only do the quests not train us in any real way as a player, we don't do anything for our character either. As I said before, this all used to be harder. Further, it's a giant dragon. I think that's enough of a training regimen to count. I'd like to point out a little side comment said on the way to this though. When getting to the boat to head to the western side of the map, the guard there mentions that he doesn't understand why we would help a bunch of beastmen. Goblins are, for lack of a better term, an ascended beast tribe within Eorzea. They've successfully integrated into natural society, though, like human bandits, there are still evil goblins. And yet a goblin with ties to the company of heroes, the saviors of Limsa Lominsa, is now just a simple beast. It further contextualizes the situation we are in. For all their bluster, they are all yet humble. And also racism is so rampant in Eorzean society that Brayflox is still just a beast to people. Though it may be because nobody knows that she is a Company of Heroes member. But that's not the only contextualizing we get as we meet Drest, a former member of the Garlean army who is just another victim. How many Garleans do we kill? And how many of them are just victims of being conquered? So that's two very important plot points that come back again and again in other points of the game and give a complete recontextualizing of the entire world we are in. This meeting with Drest is part of the Lomani section of the Feast Gathering, a member of the company who has gone blind because of the fight with Titan. He became depressed and outright suicidal, so even those who survived Titan's wrath were deeply scarred, both emotionally and physically. But Drest nursed Lomani back to health leaving us with a commentary of the ways scars affect different people. All these little things, people seem to just completely miss. But finally we are able to return with all of the pieces in the banquet in place. Yustola is sympathetic of what we went through, and also annoyed at the company of heroes, saying, We seem to have gone through the seventh circle of hell. Perhaps as a stand-in for the audience who doesn't understand why this is all important. It's then that the master of Costa del Sol, Garajuju himself, apologizes for forcing you to prepare the banquet. 
It's then that Captain Weisgate outright says that the banquet meant nothing. Remember this pin? From the very beginning, we were told we are being tested. This is mere reinforcing this. We were sent to fill the banquet for the journey, not the destination. The fact that people are so focused on that it was a banquet seem to completely misunderstand all of this. But to what end are we tested? Well, to start, this test was decided not just by these five, but the company of heroes as a whole. The five of them were chosen by the whole company to admit the test. Everyone who survived, at least. So, whatever threat Titan posed, whatever the fight entailed, everyone was in agreement. If even a few of them were not, they were so few to not even be worth mentioning, despite being fellow brothers and sisters in the battles against the primals. Even more reason to believe it was everyone who agreed to this. Either way, the choice was made to test you based on your deeds, not your reputation. While you claim you defeated Ifrit and were immune to tempering, there's no trusting it. Your reputation is not enough, and so each would measure you based on their own scale. They, once again, know the danger it entails and know how much it takes to defeat Titan. Many of their own died, and it certainly weighs heavy on their hearts. Lomani is especially proof of this. They refuse to be complicit in more deaths. It is said quite plainly at that. Titan is a danger, and Ustola is quite keen to harp on that, but sending you to your death wouldn't exactly prove any use. If you weren't worthy of beating Titan, you're going to die either way. Further, they never directly state this, but keep in mind what was said before. Kobolds are a defensive tribe, and Limsa are the ones that are at fault. What point would sending you to your death serve? The Kobolds will move slowly, but suddenly. You have time to be tested, but if you were sent out without being tested first, you'd end up angering the Kobolds. Whatever timetable you are on would immediately end. The attack on Limsa would be the moment your corpse hit the floor. Not only a waste of life, but far more dangerous than letting the Kobolds prepare. Back to the test, though. You've been tested for bravery, skill, intent, and planning. The only known force to have defeated Titan now deems you worthy of taking your own shot. They celebrate your worthiness and bid you partake in festivities. Even Nistola, who moments ago was complaining about wasting time, seems to be okay if you join in for a little bit. And there's a little joke after you eat that I want to go full galaxy brain on and say, it isn't just a joke. I posit a question to you all. What do raiders do before they head into a raid night? Take a guess. They feast. The Company of Heroes quest line is canonical raid prep. If they included a potion in there, it'd be blatantly on purpose. Celebrating your soon-to-be heroics is a bit premature, but let's put a pin in that too before preparing for our battle with Titan. Finally, we'll meet Riol and learn something else extremely interesting. Even if you were to be given the needed info to go fight Titan, you needed a Charlian to help you get to Titan. The Charlian who helped the company being speculated to have been Archon Louis based on how Riol talks about it. You know, this Louis So, uh, yeah, remember that whole argument that the companies of heroes are being irrational with their expectations and trials? They had this guy. So if you want to argue with the guy who nearly summoned the 12 gods of Eorzea with some help, then go right ahead. 
But that is the final event that leads into the fight with Titan, and the deeper important plot details. Let's take a break to talk about one of the other arguments people have against this section. Why did the Company of Heroes not at least tell the Maelstrom? They could fight, or just hold on to the info. There's no reason for them to not keep records, like this was stated in our first pin. Well, at the very beginning, you stole a said herself that the entire maelstrom, the maelstrom would not be enough. Further, even if we have again, the they're mercenaries. Why would a mercenary leave behind notes matched. about their adventures except to be and famous? Which the Company of Heroes clearly did not seek fame. Further, they devised an entire test just to seek people who are worthy of fighting Titan. And on top of all of that, why would they tell the Maelstrom? Dozens of men and women died fighting the Primals because of the Maelstrom. Remember, there was a non-aggression treaty, and Limsa are the ones who broke it, and summoned Titan and Leviathan, and forced the company to bleed and die to protect the realm. Why would they ever, ever trust the Maelstrom with the secret to reach Titan, the cause of all of their suffering. So instead, they will test people to ensure they are of pure heart and skillful enough to succeed. For the fallen, for the living, and for all of Eorzea. And speaking of Leviathan, we are canonically not strong enough to beat Leviathan on his own terms. When we do fight Leviathan, we aren't strong enough. We needed thousands of corrupted crystals to protect us from his attack. The company managed to lure Leviathan into a trap and defeated him. But keep on telling people that they have no reason to test you. Even though it's perfectly clear that these aren't just normal mercenaries. But when we finally kill Titan, the celebrations before retroactively justify themselves. We feasted for our victory against the Lord of Crags, and Minfilia is glad to call us with congratulations of our own. It's then that we return to the Waking Sands to find... bodies. Bodies everywhere. And Naraxia dying slowly on the ground. The Scions are dead or captured. We have to flee. When we next return, we're helping transport their corpses. Eight of them. And the size of the corpse determines how long it takes to pick it up. Forcing us to think about what we're doing every moment and why it's taking so long. And according to one of the workers of the Lich Yard, their bodies are starting to turn. To rot. Mere hours ago, we were celebrating in preparation of our fight against Titan. Now we carry the corpses of the Fallen to their final rest. Just like what happened five years ago. Just like the Company of Heroes. I'm not fully expecting to change all that many minds about this section of the game. Some of the complaints about this section are justified, and outright true in many cases. It's why I don't even bring them up, because there are genuinely faults with this section. But what isn't something I can just let happen is how people treat the story aspect. People write it off because LOL is a banquet, and clearly miss all the facts that we really are a nobody, and even if we weren't, they would still test us. Even our allies said it would be a challenge. And they fit in so much else into this section too, about how scars affect people, how the Garlands are made up of many victims, and the juxtaposition of being celebrated a hero, and then having to carry the corpses of our allies. The writers did more than just make do with rushing to complete 2.0 in a very short time to save the game after the failure of 1.0. They made something far more, even in that rush. They've been creating the story we love all this time, and it didn't just start 
was Heaven's word. But take care, and may the power of Ananidhogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Bubba Lau, Kathy Nock, Lemon, Meowfy, and Nick. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down below in the description. Thanks for watching.